on. We'll dive right in. Uh, this is a webinar, in my opinion. We've done a lot of webinars. Obviously, anyone that knows us knows we're very passionate about the industry. I really believe this is the most important webinar we've ever done. Um, this issue, you know, the motivation for us to write this white paper came from a, the general manager of a club we've done a fair amount of work with over the years. It was, uh, you know, born maybe out of some frustration, which I feel constantly on the misunderstanding or misconceptions that surround food and beverage in clubs. So I'm hoping, you know, look, we get a, a small piece of the industry on the webinar. We, we, we like to think change comes one club or one person at a time because that's real. But I'm really hoping that this webinar for anyone who's on this meeting impacts perspectives. We have to get out of the F and B trap. It, it has a profound negative impact on the industry. And so that's our emphasis here. You know, it, it attaches from my view, maybe this isn't completely data driven. It's more experience of being in front of so many boards and looking at so much data, but it really, this F and B issue, what we call the F and B trap, which is the whole concept of why don't we make more money in F and B or the fact that a deficit in the F and B amenity is quote unquote a bad thing or representative of quote unquote quote inefficiency is really attached to operational governance. It, it drags boards into operational governance. I spent most of today so far on the phone with two clubs that lean into the right bucket. They're very strategically governed. Both clubs are driving forward with a vision, constantly investing, constantly reinventing. The emphasis in the boardroom is on the member experience and completely and consistently evolving it over time so that it's relevant as society moves forward. And when I think about those two clubs, and I think about them in relation to most clubs that are so operationally focused, it just, it just hits, you know, hits the head. It's like a two by four over the head as to what is really right, what we have to try and do. This F and B trap drags boards into operational governance. So there's some main points that are in the white paper and main points that we are discussing today. As Terry said, by the way, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, you know, raise your hand and, and I'd like to take them in real time. That's the way we like to do the webinars rather than waiting till the end. I would suggest that in far too many clubs, and I believe it's 90%, if you look at the board as a whole or the finance committee as a whole, the the mean uh, the median number of members on a board is uh, 11, the most common is nine. Finance committee is usually five or six people. So let's call it 20 people. In every club, there are folks involved, and I get, why? I understand why. The webinar and the data we're presenting today is an attempt to evolve viewpoints, but there is a misunderstanding around the financial impact and the purpose of the food and beverage amenity to begin with. It's pervasive. I've had clubs tell me, oh, Ray, we don't worry about that here. And Six months later, I'm getting a call from that club because there's a new board member or a new finance committee member or a new house committee member. It's pervasive, let's face it. Anyone that's been in the business, whether it's voluntary leadership or, or the professional staff has dealt with this issue. So that's one point. As I said a moment ago, 
this misunderstanding is a major challenge to elevating strategic governance over operational governance. If you are involved in governance as a board or committee member, the goal of this webinar is, you know, first I'd ask you with great passion and uh, empathy, because I've been on that side of the table, to see if we can open our minds for an hour or so so that we can change the context you apply to the food and beverage amenity at your club. And this white paper and this webinar is an attempt by club benchmarking to get the industry through this knothole, through overcoming this misunderstanding challenge. I believe, and I've recently read a book that was so, so good. It's called Un uh, Common Nonsense, Uncommon Sense. And it hits on so much of what we learned studying this data. But the, the key point is context is a critical concept in everything, in business and life. We have to think about what our own context is relative to, let's say, the, the correct frame of reference or the reality frame of reference. I'm a person who believes there is some kind of objective reality in that we all bring our different viewpoints to it. I get it, but there is reality, and we have to try and discern what it is. There's two contexts that I see applied around food and beverage. One is we'll refer to as the efficiency context. And the, the basic anchor points in that context or frame of reference are, and I get it, I come from the for-profit business world. I've run companies, I've answered to boards, I've had to deliver bottom line results. I understand management, I understand managing costs, expenses, efficiency, et cetera. But, but not every industry is driven in the same manner. Loss in F and B in the frame of reference of the efficiency context, loss is indicative of inefficiency waste or that there's something wrong. Another part of the, the anchoring process in this context, restaurants make money, why don't we? That the financial impact of F and B, if we're losing money, has a significant negative impact on the club's overall financial outcome. And then finally, in these situations, you can see it happen. I've seen it happen hundreds of times where the board, the finance committee, the house committee really descend on the GM and the staff to fix this problem of the loss, constantly asking for reports, constantly asking for questions, doing deep dives of operational reviews until we fix the problem. So that's one context that exists. And I believe it's the most common one, frankly. The other context is that the financial results in F&B reflect the way we choose to treat F&B. We'll get into this in detail. Clubs are not restaurants or vice versa. They're completely different industries. Would we compare our golf or yachting amenities to the municipal golf course of the public marina around the corner? We don't. We don't. We know they're different. We understand that. Well, it's restaurants and, and F and B operations and clubs are just as dissimilar as a municipal golf course and a private golf club. They aren't the same thing. They have 18 holes, but the, but the similarities end there. All amenities in clubs lose money. That's the point of paying dues. We, if every department made a profit, we wouldn't have to pay dues. But it isn't, doesn't work that way. We pay dues in a common interest approach to defray the cost of operating the club. I've come to think of clubs, and, and the, the, the catalyst for the thought is an experiment we're going to talk about in this webinar that I wrote about in the white paper of Monterey Peninsula Country Club. When they did what they did with F and B, it made me think, you know, it just was so graphic to me. It made me realize that if you think about a club and you think about it as a black box 
inside that black box is a value proposition or value delivered. The greater the value in that box, the, the, the more enticing the value proposition, the more the demand for people to get inside the box and access the value. Food and beverage is a key amenity inside that box that drives that value. It's as, that, as simple as that. So if we shift our context, as Monterey Peninsula has done, then we can say to the GM and staff, let's use food and beverage to, to buttress a compelling member experience that engages, retains, and attracts members. Let's aim this thing at member satisfaction and engagement more than the financial outcome, just as we do with our other amenities in 80% in of the clubs that have golf, with golf as an example, in tennis clubs, with tennis as an example, in city athletic clubs, with our athletic programming and uh, networking as an example. Food and beverage is the same. I, I guess I coined the, the, the term, the F&B trap, and I, and I think of it that way because I see it. I see clubs stuck in this trap. Clubs can become stuck. We just become stuck in the way we've been doing things. We're not dynamic. Half, I would suggest respectfully, but half of the club industry, for the most part, is stuck. We're not living in 2020, we're living in 1990. We have to be unstuck, we have to be dynamic, we have to be constantly evolving, evolving, constantly innovating. So how do we get out of the trap? I'm hoping this, I'm really, I'm telling you, I can't put more emotion into this or more effort into it than to try and help. If we help one person or one club on this webinar escape this trap, We've done our service. If we can help more than one, great. The data is very clear. I'm going to lead us all through the data today. It is what it is. We have to embrace it. We can't shun or reject it. This is real. The data that we have to present to you today is comprehensive and diverse. It's approximately 1,000 clubs, 49 or 50 states in the United States, and five Canadian provinces. It's all types of clubs, golf, country, city, and athletic, yacht, and other, tennis, et cetera. It's small clubs. It's large clubs. It's clubs that offer world-class service and very pedestrian service. This is a diverse set of data. It's accurate data. It comes right from the same source that your auditors use to audit your finances. We've mapped nearly 12,000, uh, I'm sorry, 12,000, 10,000 trial balances. We have a process that is repeatable and refined. The data we show you today is apples to apples. You see in certain cases, people who are involved in governance or on committees or members of clubs who have come to a conclusion with no data whatsoever, and they will actually push back on the general manager or the controller, or they'll push back on their fellow peers in the boardroom and say, that data is not right. I've yet to meet anyone that can show me any other data that controverts any of what we've learned. And I can tell you confidently, I hope I'm not sounding cocky, but confident, that data doesn't exist. This is it. This is the data from the industry. A thousand clubs is roughly 3,000 member owned clubs of substance in the US and Canada, maybe 3,500. So, you know, this is really statistically relevant, it's comprehensive, it's real. We can't reject the data. If we're doing it, we're literally shirking a fiduciary duty. The data shows clearly that the financial outcomes in F&B are a result of choice, not something being wrong or inefficiency. And objective people embracing this data we'll reach that conclusion. I didn't come to the conclusions that we're gonna see here today and then find the data to support the conclusion. The conclusions that we've arrived at in club benchmarking over the last 11 or 12 years 
is from studying the data. It's the data that drove the conclusions, not the other way around. We have to change our context to match the facts. Hey, I know everyone's not going to do it. I get it. It's not an ideal world. And so there are going to pe be people who anchor in. But there have to be other people. That's why there's not one person on a board and there's nine or 11 or 13, because we get more perspectives. And what we need to do is have most people have a, a frame of reference that's proper. Maybe there's going to always be one that has an incorrect frame of reference. So the exercise that we put forth in the white paper is really an exercise in logic and fact-based insight. I'm, I'm almost approaching this like a, a physics professor or a lawyer. I'm trying to lay out a case based on facts. So I'm trying to react to the things that we've heard over the many years now from clubs and folks who are stuck in the food and beverage trap. We've heard this rest, this question. I've heard it asked. People have asked it. I've been asked this question a hundred or more times. Why don't we make money like a restaurant to which we apply logic? Well, first off, which restaurant are we talking about? The high-end chef-owned restaurant on Main Street or McDonald's? They're not, they're not even the same business. They're in the same industry but they're in very different segments of the industry. A paper was written, I finally got my hands on it. It was published in 1991. Chris Muller and Robert Woods, Cornell and Michigan State, not Michigan T State, <laughs> typo. Um, they studied three local markets, the restaurants and three markets over a 10 year period, not, you know, a uh, specious effort, a very diligent and detailed effort. After the first year, 27% of restaurant startups failed. After three years, 50% of those restaurants were no longer in business. After five years, 60% had gone out of business. And after a decade, 70% of the restaurants that had opened for a business, opened for business a decade before, failed. My father, when I was a kid, he always used to kind of, I guess, drill business into my head. He used to sell to restaurants. And he used to tell me, I constantly heard the refrain, Ray, if, you, if you're getting in the business, think hard before you get in the restaurant business. It's not an easy business. My wife is very involved in the state of Massachusetts. The latest data is 25% of the restaurants in the state won't open their doors after the, or haven't opened their doors and will not open their doors after the pandemic. Anyone that's really in touch with business and is thinking critically realizes that the restaurant world isn't a great business to begin with. So I know it can become a comparative point. I also know it's not clubs. But even if you just take restaurants as a whole, there's not a lot of profit being generated. That's just reality. That's the data. I didn't make that data. That came from Cornell and Michigan State, two of the most rep reputable hospitality programs in the world. You know, that leads me to wonder, what really has happened to critical thinking? When we're governing, and this webinar maybe is from the perspective more so of the board members. I, I, I was on my own club's board for 10 years. I see the way people address governance and clubs. I've been in front of so many boards. It, can, it doesn't take a lot of thought, frankly, to see those who are motivated to try and understand versus those who already have an opinion before the question's asked. We're trying to look at this through the lens of critical thinking. So there's a term in economics, as we know, called on the margin. It means different things. But to me, what it means is when we're making decisions, let's talk about F&B as an example. When we're making decisions in F&B, a fundamental on the margin choice is, 
Should we try to make more money in F and B or lose less, or should we try to make the experience better? It's it, the on the margin means from where we sit today. You know, I wouldn't suggest to any club that you double your dues overnight. We all have to do it from the point at where we're at today. But the decisions on the margin from where we are today, those are the ones that matter. And I know from the data that if we're making a choice on the margin in our respective clubs between making the experience better and losing a little more, that's the way to go versus losing a little less and making the experience worse his data that informs it there's almost a thousand clubs on this chart it shows the bottom line result in f and b last year so on the very far left that's the the fifth percentile on the very far right is the 95th percentile you can see there's clubs that are losing more than a million and a half dollars in there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I guess I'll follow my old slides. I'll use the term loss for now, but I'd like to replace it with deficit. There's clubs that are generating a deficit greater than a million and a half. And on the other end, you can see the break even point. I put the, uh, the line right on the break even point. That's 20% of all of the clubs. So 20% of the industry is breaking even or generating a surplus in F and B, and 80% of the industry has a deficit in F and B. This is the same data viewed through another lens. This is the profit or surplus or deficit as a percentage of the F and B revenue. So it's a more normalizing view. Again, you can see the break-even point is at the 80th percentile. There's four quartiles we're going to investigate. So the lower quartile, a quarter of the clubs in the industry have a deficit in F&B that is 25% of the revenue or greater. The second quartile, a quarter of the clubs in the industry have a deficit in F&B that is between 25% of the revenue in F&B and 12% of the revenue in F&B. The third quartile is a deficit between 12% and 2% of the revenue. Now we're sneaking up on the break-even group. And then a quarter of the industry has, is essentially breaking even or generating a slight surplus in F&B. So for starters, in terms of escaping the F and B trap, I suggest words matter. It isn't necessarily a loss. A loss has negative implications for anyone in business, and I understand that. I suggest it's a deficit or a surplus. It's not a loss or a profit. And the difference between whether it's a deficit or a surplus relates to choice, not efficiency. That's the key. Those those three points are key to helping escape the F and B trap. Again, thinking critically, is it logical to think that if 80% of the clubs have a deficit in F and B, it's the result of inefficiency and or doing something wrong? Generally speaking, the people running the F&B operation, the GM, the food and beverage manager, the chef, these are all people who understand food and beverage. They've been in the industry. They've got degrees from Cornell and Michigan State and Johnson and Wales and these other leading hospitality schools around the world. Many of them have worked at Marriott or Rich Carlton or worked I'm thinking of one particular GM I'm very friendly with. He ran for-profit restaurants before he came, became a, a general manager of a private club. The folks running these operations aren't ignorant. They've been trained to run these operations. So is it logical for someone to believe 
because there's a deficit in F and B that something's wrong? I don't believe so. I'd say right out of the gate with this data, we can come to a, we can start shifting our context, a frame of reference to the amenity view as opposed to the efficiency view. Ray, we're coming up close on the halfway mark, so I have two questions. Yep. The first one is how many clubs was it that were taken into account for these graphs? Uh, it's about a thousand clubs. It's in the 900 range, somewhere in the 900 or so range. Okay, and this next one you could do now or do when you get further in. Um, I understand the F and B trap concept and also buy into the concept. However, I think the white paper selected an atypical club for the case study. Monterey Peninsula Country Club is a club that enjoys the luxury of a seven-year waiting list and an initiation fee of 350,000 plus. 99% of clubs don't enjoy those dues initiation fee waiting lists. Yep, and 99% and of clubs aren't that club, and this data reflects those 99% of clubs, as I said at the outset. So we're gonna to let to that question, it's a good question. Monterey Peninsula is only used as an example to draw out concepts. It's not something that I or we are advocating all clubs do, but there is a lesson in there. It's, it's used as a, con, as, a, as a way to ferment concepts. This data, this table represents what I, would suggest is a broad cross-section in a diverse cross-section of the industry. So I agree with the questioner in that perspective, but we're gonna let the data draw. We're gonna let the data evolve from the data we have. It's not, they're one of 900. So here's a table that relates back to the previous slide where we looked at the four quartiles. Um, the first, the quartile where the clubs are subsidizing F and B the most, that have the greatest deficits, the median subsidy of the F and B operation as, as a percentage of the overall operating dues is minus 16. And you can see what it's doing as we move to the right. So as we move to the right, the deficit in F and B begins to shrink, okay? First point is the second row. This is the operating result. 90% of the clubs in the country set the operating ledger or income statement to break even excluding depreciation. In all four quartiles, the re median result is essentially break even outcome. And the point is, this links back to the overall financial impact on the club of F and B. The clubs that subsidize the F&B the most still break even operationally, and the clubs that have a surplus in F&B still break even operationally. But when you look at the fourth row, the initiation fee, you can see there's a drastic shift. The median in the in the far left column is almost 50,000. It's 10,000 in the far right column. The most important financial metric in a club is the member's equity, the equity on the balance sheet, no different than any business. Look at the difference in the, in the upper quartile versus the lower quartile. Now to the previous questioner's point, this gets to something, okay? Which is, yeah, that club enjoys those great parameters and not every club does, I get it. But the reason clubs have low member's equity is because they haven't invested in their experience consistently over time and they're less relevant. The data is very clear about that. So the clubs that subsidize F&B the most have a member's equity at the median of $14 million. And the clubs that have a surplus of break even in F&B at the median have a member's equity of 5 million. That's a huge difference. And then if you look at the percent of clubs in each quartile, that are generating adequate capital as evidenced by our net available capital ratio, twice as many, twice as many, by the way, across the industry, 
nearly three quarters of the clubs in the industry aren't meeting the threshold. There's two issues. Do we meet the threshold of capital we need? And the second issue is how far short of the threshold do we, do we fall? The twice as many clubs meet the threshold in the segment of the market that subsidizes F and B the most. In the clubs that don't meet the threshold are much closer to the threshold than the clubs that generate a surplus in F and B where only 20% meet the threshold and the ones that aren't meeting the threshold are severely undercapitalized. The healthiest clubs financially are the clubs in the lower quartile of F and B outcome, meaning they subsidize F and B the most. And the weakest clubs in the industry are the ones that generate a surplus or break even in F and B. Quick question, Ray. Someone, someone's yep. asked how much deficit is too much or subsidy? Uh, it's, it's a choice. Too much isn't, you know, it's, it's, I'd say this, because we will use, look at the Monterey Pencil example. It's a choice that we get to make. The fundamental concept that we're going to talk about today is this. You have to cover the cost of operating F&B in a club. They're mostly fixed. And you cover them one of two ways. You cover them through margin on F&B revenue or you cover them through due subsidies. There's pros and cons to each approach. So let's zero in on that question when we get to the pros and cons of each of those approaches. This, this chart is the chart that's had the most impact on me. You know, in the 11 or 12 years I've been studying this stuff. This chart changed my whole view of club finances. It took us seven years to discover the concepts and principles behind it here. But as I said earlier, 90% of the clubs in the country set the income statement, AKA also known as operating ledger, to break even excluding depreciation. This is just the data that confirms it. The median club had an operating result that was 1% of the operating revenue, we'll call it the operating margin. At club benchmarking, we say, any club between minus four and plus four, which is basically 70% of the clubs, is hovering around the break-even zone. The point is this, and this informs the view of F&B as an amenity. The operating ledger isn't the financial driver of clubs. The financial driver is capital income, which is evidenced by the gold line. So the club that broke even, the median, had capital income equivalent to 15% of the operating revenue, that's the pile of cash, that's the free cash a club has to drive itself forward financially. So F and B revenue and expense is contained in the operating ledger. And I just showed in the previous table, even the clubs with the greatest F and B deficits break even operationally because they set the dues to cover the deficit in F and B. So F and B financial results as a whole don't even impact the financial outcome of a club. So why are we zeroing in on them? This is critical thinking again. It doesn't impact the financial outcome. It ex what happens is it impacts the membership experience outcome. We can play games all day we want long. We want with the F and B, uh, the F and B department. It's not going to impact the, the the outcome of the club financially over time, unless we treat it as a profit center and it's a lousy experience, and we can't attract and retain members because there's nothing at the club they really like. In in satisfaction surveys and motivation surveys of why people join clubs, food and beverage is preeminent over all the other amenities. Makes sense because that ultimately clubs are social clubs. So what causes the financial results in F&B? Ultimately, it's choice. Those clubs that have the greatest deficits have the most venues, have the most meal periods and service hours available, have the highest quality of food and beverage, have the highest service levels, 
what really drives the uh, financial result in F and B purely is the F and B labor to revenue ratio. The clubs with the greatest deficits have more labor, and the clubs with the surpluses restrict the labor. Pricing has a massive impact, which we'll see. Most clubs target a la carte to a 40% cost of goods, but there is wide variation. And of course, there's a mix between banquets and a la carte that are going to drive the outcome. So using Monterey Peninsula only as a way to draw out the concepts, not advocating that clubs do this, although I am advocating passionately clubs understand this. If you think about the cost in F and B, there's two ways to cover them, through margin on F&B sales or through dues. All that, all that Monterey Peninsula did was to decided we're going to cover the cost of operating F&B the same way we cover the cost of operating golf courses, which is it's a fixed cost that we're going to share equally amongst the members. Once you do that, it means you don't have to try to drive margin on revenue through pricing to cover the cost because the costs are covered before you cook one hamburger through dues. So what that offered them an opportunity to do was to dramatically reduce pricing. So wine prices dropped, as you see here, significantly. The price of a, of a bone-in ribeye went from $54 to $22. These are dramatic changes. If you apply that concept to all clubs, again, 900 clubs on this chart, and you say that margin is the contribution from all F&B revenue minus the cost of goods sold, the cost of food and the cost of beverage, that's the margin. You can see that a break-even point shows up. I'm on the right side of the chart. I think you can see the cursor. I'm on the right side of the chart where that circle is. You can see that certain clubs where the cost of F and B were covered uh, by the margin. And you can see that on the left side, it was less from margin. So those are the clubs that lean heavily towards food and beverage as an amenity. And the others are the clubs that are generating a surplus. What costs we have to cover in F and B are the labor, both the back of house and the front of house. So the kitchen and the, the wait staff, supplies and materials, equipment repairs and maintenance, uniforms, laundry and linen. We put entertainment expenses at the club into F and B in our apples to apples framework, and then all other F and B expenses. If you take Monterey Peninsula. And you look at the way they cover the cost of F and B, 67% is covered from their dues subsidy, and 33% is covered from the margin they produce on their F and B revenue. The average club, it's 85-15, 85% from margin and 15% from dues. It's the exact opposite. The most important point today, again, not advocating clubs jump into the right here. I'm not jumping to the left. I'm not advocating that. But what I am advocating is that the volunteer leadership who have attended this session, thank you first, we realized that what drove the change at Monterey isn't because they became inefficient overnight. It's because they changed their model overnight. They just decided they're going to cover the do the cover the F and B costs through dues mainly, not through margin on revenue. That's not efficiency; it's choice. And this distribution represents choices clubs are making, not efficiency issues. Again, we have professional staffs, professional teams, very cognizant and savvy in food and beverage operations, and 80% of them have a deficit. And the ones with the greatest deficit are the healthiest clubs overall. So in the end, 
you get to make your own choice. But I'm hoping, I am imploring that we embrace this concept that it's choice that drives the outcome, not whether we're efficiency or not. Just think though through the concepts. If a given club offers lower prices and higher quality, I mean, ultimately the margin is impacted by the pricing and the quality of food and beverage that's purchased and to be prepared. So if a given club low, offers lower prices and higher quality, what do you think is going to happen to the results in F&B? Obviously, the deficit will increase. But what happens to member satisfaction? What happens if a club decides to offer really low prices and really high quality? On the other side of the coin, what happens if a club chooses to cover F&B costs through margin? Who's covering the cost of F&B then? The engaged members who use the club regularly or the members who make the minimum? What happens to satisfaction? This is a table that was in the, in the white paper. If you look at the pros and cons of the two approaches, again, the concept, the spectrum, we could cover the cost through margin or through due subsidy. The biggest issue in my mind, there's two big issues. The biggest one is fairness. If we're covering it through margin, then our heaviest and most engaged members are absorbing the bulk of the costs of operating F&B so that our least engaged members and our, the members who basically show up to make the minimum in F&B have all of that service staff and all of that quality available for them only contributing a small piece of the puzzle. There's two, essentially two types of clubs. Some clubs have a per chick gratuity. Every time you go in, you have to pay 15, 18, 20% on top of what you purchase. Some clubs have a level service fee. So you don't have a per chick gratuity, but the members all contribute a certain amount annually for a level service fee. The least fair method is the per chick gratuity. Because now you got those members covering through the margin on the food and beverage they consumed and through their service charge. The level service fee is more fair because then everyone's sharing equally in the service fees, but not everyone's sharing equally in the margin. The heavy users are covering more. And then the most fair is if we spread the costs out equally amongst all members. That's fan. It's a fairness issue. That's point one. Point two, it's a satisfaction and engagement issue. One of the things Monterey Peninsula experienced is their food and beverage staff got more creative because they didn't have to produce menus when we changed the menus, worrying about what the margin on the pricing in the food and, and beverage we put on the menu. A lot of the menu selection has to do with meeting the cost of goods target. If you don't have to worry about that, it's a whole different experience. Again, these are concepts. That choice is fundamental, though. I really, the thing that resonates with me about this is the fairness of the issue. We've done enough analysis to know that roughly 30% of the members in a club generate 70% of the a la carte spend. So across the industry, those are the members who are really bearing the burden of running the F&B operation. Can you imagine if we did that in golf? Can you imagine if after paying your dues, you had to pay a greens fee every time you played? How do you think that the golfers who play 120 rounds a year would fail versus the golfers who only play 20 rounds a year? Probably would cause some consternation. It's the same principle. It's the exact same principle in F and B. Back to critical thinking. We literally, literally receive multiple calls every week from someone inquiring about the loss in F and B. In 12 years, I, our company, has never, and I have never received a call inquiring about the loss in golf. The median subsidy of F&B from the dues revenue that we pay is 8%. The 
The median subsidy in golf is 33% of the dues. Now that's taken all the golf revenue minus all the golf costs with the leftover, that's combining golf operations and cost maintenance with that leftover expense having to be subsidized by dues. Look at the difference in the magnitude. It's four to 10 times greater in golf than it is in F&B. So if we're really concerned about loss in a particular department and we apply a concept of logic of critical thinking, why are we not receiving calls about the loss in golf? You know, to me, this is like a showstopper. Anyone who veers towards objectivity has to look at this and say, wait a minute, something doesn't make sense here. It's pervasive. Let's look at it another way, back to critical thinking. This shows the dues, where the dues go in a club, the average club. It's clubs with golf and clubs without golf, all thrown in one bucket. What's the biggest pie slice on that chart? I'm, I'm sorry, this is clubs. Yeah, it is clubs with all, clubs with golf and without golf. So we put them all in one bucket. I'm sorry. If we just had clubs with golf, that green slice would be bigger. The biggest pie slice is golf. The next biggest is G&A. The next biz, biggest is operating and maintaining the buildings. You got to go pretty far around the horn to get to where the dues are going in terms of F and B. 8% of the dues are going to subsidize F and B. It's the second least, or the third least amount on this, on this chart. Can you imagine that? Why are we focusing so intensely on that one little piece of the pie slice? If we're thinking about where our money as members goes from operating the club, why the such scrutiny on that one little pie slice? That's less than 10% of the whole pie. Why? I think I can say why. I think it's a lack of context. I think it's a lack of data and fact-based insight. And I think it's misunderstanding fed by opinion. We've learned two things so far that are critical. One, the clubs that have the largest deficit in F&B are the healthiest clubs financially with the highest initiation fees and the most capital and the highest members' equity. And two, F&B's use of member dues is very low on the totem pole of where dues money goes. So what the heck is this focus all about? It makes no sense. So once we've changed our contextual frame of reference, what could we do with all the time and I'm telling you, if you look across the thousand clubs I've dealt with, if you look across all of them, I can't overemphasize the time and effort and discussion that goes into this F&B trap that is purely unproductive. What should we talk about in replacing all that time and effort? How about we start with this? If you look at the industry, it sorts itself very organically into three buckets. Red bucket clubs, which are not doing well at all and are in serious jeopardy of closing in the next few years. Yellow bucket clubs, which are kind of going sideways. And then green bucket clubs, which are doing very well and growing with purpose and uh, have very strong balance sheets and have waiting lists. The red bucket clubs are the ones that break even or make money in F and B. The green bucket clubs are the clubs with the greatest deficit in F and B. Why don't we figure out which bucket our club is in? I'm, I'm probably sounding a little bit negative right now. I apologize. I'm, I'm just too passionate about this. I just spent so much time for so long. I get into discussions in boardrooms with board members who can cite verb and verse what the cost of goods and F and food and beverage are, and I ask them what the member's equity on the balance sheet is, and they don't know. What? We don't even know what the balance sheet looks like, but we can tell you what the cost of goods are 
in food and beverage? Seriously. We have to get out of this trap. We got to figure out which bucket our club is in. These are large segments of the industry here. Quarter of the industry, 50%. If we're a red bucket pluck club, we sure as heck better be figuring out how to become a yellow bucket. And if we're yellow, how we become green. If we really care about the club, if we care about the future, a lot of these clubs are 50, 100, more than 100 years old. If we're going to be stewards to perpetuate these great local institutions, many of which have historical links, historical impact on our communities, let's start talking about what matters. Let's talk about the balance sheet. Let's talk about our capital needs. Capital needs, capital investment, that's what drives financial success over time in clubs. We can cite ver verb and verse about the cost of goods in F&B, but we can't say what are our millions of dollars of obligatory capital needed for the next five or 10 years? Or what are we going to do from an aspirational perspective to drive growth in this club, to make the club relevant in 2020? The two clubs, again, I was on the Zooms with today, extremely focused on aspirational growth, extremely focused on the member experience in investing and evolving the member experience so that it stays relevant. These are weighty issues. I hope this logic that I'm piling up now is starting to topple the importance of this F and B issue. How about we do a quick measure? This takes five minutes looking at the audited financial statement. How about we measure where our asset base falls on this curve? Are our assets depleted and depreciated or are they freshen up to date? We think that this ratio should be 55% or higher. It's a quarter of the industry. Three quarters are on the wrong side of that ratio. I'm asking those on the webinar, have you discussed your net to gross PP&E ratio in a board meeting or a finance committee or a house meeting more than you discuss the cost of goods in F&B or the financial outcome in F&B? I know the answer because I've been in enough clubs. If you answer honestly, we don't even talk about this. These are the topics that should replace F and B. How about members equity or the net worth portion of the balance sheet? This is a distribution. One third of the clubs meet what we think the threshold is in growing members equity over the time. Two thirds don't. The red bucket clubs have members equity declining precipitously. Green bucket clubs are growing members' equity. We use Carmel and Charlotte as, as an example of best-in-class benchmark. This is a measure of how well a club's doing at aggregating the capital to meet its future capital needs. And it's a measure of how relevant a club is in its marketplace. I did an analysis of Amazon's equity on their balance sheet since 2006, which is the same time frame as this data, a club. Amazon's equity has grown at a compounded annual growth rate since 2006 of 47%. Macy's shareholders equity has grown at a compounded annual growth rate of minus 6% since 2006. Which company is more relevant in 2020, Macy's or Amazon? It's the same principle. If our members' equity isn't growing adequately or if it's shrinking, it's a huge sign that our value proposition is not relevant. The clubs with declining members' equity are the ones that generate a surplus in F&B. The clubs with growing members' equity are the clubs that have the deficits in F and B. So in conclusion, F and B is an amenity. If if this data doesn't convince everyone on this webinar, 
I'd like to, I really, I'm making, a, I'm, I'm pleading with anyone that has any data that contra, controverts what we just presented. I'd love to see it because I'm a learner. I want to learn. If this is incorrect, straighten us out. I'm very confident that it isn't, that no data exists, no facts exist to controvert this. Are there exceptions to the rule? Are there green bucket clubs that generate a surplus in F&B? Absolutely. There aren't many, but there are. Are there red bucket clubs that have a great deficit in F&B? Yes, they are. there are. I'm talking about on the whole, the concepts that apply. As a whole, we saw it with the data. The healthiest clubs financially have the, deficit, the greatest deficits in F&B. And the weakest clubs financially have the surpluses in F&B. Clubs that treat F&B as an amenity are much healthier than those that don't. At the fundamental baseline, at a minimum, if we could just say that the webinar today has helped us recognize that a loss or a deficit isn't because something wrong and that the outcome results from choice, not efficiency, then we made progress. The ultimate choice is whether we cover our F&B costs through margin on sales or through a due subsidy. The more we lean towards due subsidy, the fairer it is amongst all the members. If you're a club that feels like you're stuck in the trap, then use this data to escape the trap. Figure out which bucket your club is in. We can help you do that. It's a free service we provide. Figure out how you can make your club and member experience better. They go hand in hand. Let's see what your net worth's been doing over time. Let's benchmark your balance sheet and understand how strong or weak it might be. Let's start to talk about what capital we need in the future so that we can aggregate it proactively. We can figure out where it's coming from. Let's figure out what the vision for the future is for our club. And I mean real vision. Where's this club going to be in five years? These are the important topics, not the cost of goods or the deficit of surplus in F&B. And, and then finally, I had a question come in uh, via email this morning about the concept of F&B minimums and would we address that in the webinar? And I, uh, Terry and I said we would. So, so Ray, before you, some... you hit that one, I actually have yep. a, a significant number of questions. So what I'm going to suggest is those are all logged and that log will go to Ray and he can respond to you. So if you have a question while he's addressing this F&B minimum, piece, um, go ahead and type it in the question pane and I'll make sure he gets it. Okay, thank you. And then in the meantime, I do want to show um, just one thing, please. Um, so, here we go. so, we do the strategic monthly dashboard, another free service for the industry. And we've done something that I think and I hope will help all of us manage and govern better and it conceivably could revolutionize the industry. But we track the cost of belonging in great detail in real time every month. And one of the things we look at is the minimum spend in F&B, 56% of clubs this isn't a thousand clubs, this is about 300 that are participating now. 56% levy an F&B minimum, and the median annually is $805. If you look at the group of clubs that have a minimum versus don't have a minimum, and you quantify the subsidy of F&B in terms of dues revenue, it's it's you probably can't see this as easily, but without a minimum, it's minus 14 at the 25th percentile. With the minimum, it's minus 12. Not exactly the same, but pretty darn close. It's minus nine without and minus eight 
width. I'm sorry, minus six width at the median. And it's minus two without and minus one width. So the financial results in F and B are mostly the same from a dues standpoint in the two clubs, the clubs that have a minimum and don't have a minimum. We would suggest that minimum requirements in F and B are a thing of the past. We would suggest that we kind of wrap it into dues so everyone's paying equally and we have more room to work with in our F and B member experience and we try to deliver an experience that that brings people in rather than forces people in. The whole concept of forcing someone in to make a minimum, I mean, just on the surface, it sounds antiquated to me. I'll say, I didn't say this in the, during the webinar, I'll say it now. It's only a coincidence, by the way, but eight years ago, I had a hamburger at Monterey Peninsula Country Club long before they did what they did with the pricing. And I took one bite out of it and I almost fell out of my chair because it was so darn good. I love hamburgers. I made a decision that day. Every time I order a hamburger a la carte off a menu at a club, which is often, I order it. Every time I order a la carte off a menu, I order a hamburger. So I've had a hamburger now in over 200 clubs in America and Canada. If you do that and you pay attention to it, which I do, part of my job, it's kind of interesting, but I can almost tell what's going on in F&B and frankly, what's going on in a club just by eating a hamburger. There are hamburgers served in clubs that will knock your socks off. And there are hamburgers served in clubs that I'd be ashamed to serve off a grill in my backyard. There's wide variation. Some clubs buy frozen hamburger patties already made. Some clubs make their own meat and they put great thought and effort into what goes into that meat. The best hamburger I ever had in a club. I was sitting with the GM, I told the GM, this is probably the best one I've ever had. His retort was, you know how long it took for us to get that hamburger you just ate, Ray? I said, what? Now, I'm thinking he's going to say a week or a month. He said it took us a year and a half of experimenting. What's the type of meat? What's the mix of lean versus fat? Do we put spice in the burger or not put spice in the burger? What kind of bun do we use? Do we grill the bun or toast the bun? Do we put butter on the bun or not put butter on the bun? 18 months of experimentation before the GM and the chef said, that's the burger we want. That's F and B as an amenity. I would join the club, I'm not exaggerating, to get the darn hamburger. Just like there are people joining Monterey Peninsula for the food and beverage experience. And it's not just those high priced clubs. There are other clubs in this North America that are magnets for prospective members because of the F and B experience. Just like there are clubs that are magnets because of the golf experience or the fitness and wellness experience or the aquatics experience or the ski shooting experience or the social networking experience. Food and beverage is the same. Let's move forward as an industry. Let's get out of this F&B trap and focus on the member experience and stop worrying about pennies, please. Sorry, a little over the top with the uh, emphasis there. If there are any other questions in the meantime. Um, I think, so Ray, I think we're about 10 minutes over. So I think okay. that what I want to do is leave it up. Um, if anybody wants to type in another question, um, I'll leave the I'll leave the question pane open for a little bit. If you want to um, close your screen, and then we'll 
we'll go ahead and let everybody go. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, really, really good session. Lots of comments. People are people are appreciating your passion, um, and there's a ton of good questions here. So, well, thank you, thank you, everyone, and uh, we're here to help if you, if we can help. Thank you. Thank you.